Welcome back to Alberta Prime Time. Is 2012 the year to get a better deal on your loans? And debating where best to put your RRSPs now. Our Monday Money panel is in tonight. Jane Alm is an investment advisor with Angus Watt Advisory and National Bank Financial. Beth Hamilton Keene is a director and portfolio manager at Moore Investment Management. And Shafiq Karani is director and senior executive financial advisor with Investors Group Calgary. Welcome back, everyone. Well, thank, thank you. you. Shafiq, let me start with you. Interest rates are still at historic lows. Are all Albertans taking advantage, though? Are all renegotiating old loans or doing the best that they could on new ones? Uh, not even close. And, you know, it's funny, the, the, the banks and all the lending institutions, they're not as quick to lower interest rates on our lines of credits and our car loans and our student loans. Uh, as fast because, you know, obviously they make money off of it. Sure. So uh, Albertans, there's a report by TD Economics, and Albertans are one of the highest in-debt provinces in Canada. So there is a very good opportunity to take advantage of lower mortgage rates, which look like they're going to stay low for the next uh, couple of years, as well as renegotiate some of our lines of credits and, and uh, other loans. So Beth, help us out there. Where and how can Albertans push a little? Well, certainly take a look at uh, the, the lines of credit rates, uh, as Shavik was mentioning, and, and definitely take a look at where your mortgage renewal date is coming up. Keep an eye on that, because that will certainly help you uh, for those that have existing mortgages in, in terms of getting an idea. And, and, and within six months of that mortgage renewal date, if it happens to be coming up in 2012, start to shop around. Definitely look around. You don't want to just go through that automatic renewal process that all of our financial institutions would prefer we take. Take, a, take that opportunity to shop around and see who's offering the better rates. Right now, however, there has been a shift. The variable rates that used to be, you know, quite cutthroat and quite competitive, those variable rates aren't giving us the deals that they used to anymore. And that's an indicator that interest rates may be getting prepared to go up or the, or the overall market is getting prepared for interest rate increases. Mm -hmm. So I think we're near the bottom of interest rates. I don't think that we'll be seeing uh, great strides up in the near term, certainly in the first few months of the year. But I think it's something that we all need to prepare for and take an eye, keep an eye on what might happen to your debt if interest rates do begin to go up, because eventually it will. Yeah, and that'll change your monthly payments by a lot. Just going back to your first point, do you have to wait until a renewal date, or can you yeah, go in point. at any time? You know, uh, sorry to cut you off, but very good point, Jen, because right now we've seen a lot of clients that are coming in at, at 5 and 6% mortgage rates. And what they're doing is they're waiting until this maturity date. But, you you know, if you do the math, often the banks, they charge a penalty to break a mortgage early. And that penalty is usually based on one of two things, something called the interest rate differential between current rates and their current mortgage rate, and something called, uh, or three months interest. If you can do a calculation to find out what that penalty is, find out what the current rates are, often you can save thousands uh, per year on, right. on just a So a penalty a might be worth it. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, Jane, Alberta... Three-month penalty is definitely worth it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, Alberta financial writer Ray Truchansky and at least one consumer advocate are musing about creating affordable 10-year mortgages, but that's really the problem, isn't it? Longer is never all that affordable. Uh, there's no way around it, is there? Well, they were looking at a 30-year mortgage. What happens with a 30-year mortgage is you're locking in an interest rate for that full period of time. If you can stay in a shorter period, one year, two years, three years, a number that you're comfortable with where you can set a budget, you'll always end up with a lower rate overall than if you go the longer term. It also allows you the flexibility to take advantage of rate changes, like we were just talking about, other things that will happen within your life. So there's definite advantages to staying short rather than going long on your mark mortgage. If affording the payments is an issue and you're looking at longer and longer terms, maybe renting isn't so bad. If, you're, if you cannot afford your mortgage payments, that's not the only part of owning a house. There's insurance, there's utilities, there's the cost of your yard and your maintenance and all the equipment that you need to do that. So when you're looking at your mortgage payment, you can't just look at that as a standalone, this is what it's going to cost me to live in that house. You also have to keep money aside for upkeep. If you're buying an older home, you may need a new roof, a new furnace. Beth, can you walk into your bank with another offer in hand and throw that down as a bit of a challenge? 
Certainly, that's something you could you could do, and in fact, most banks will it will compete for your business, so they'll do a lot of the hard work and math for you in terms of that. Uh, what I would suggest, though, in terms of it's really hard for a bank to to, to provide you with a 30-year term. That's just something not available no. here at this point. Uh, but definitely, you can look at what what the banks have available. Uh, there's a, a wide menu of choices uh, to choose from in terms of variability, in terms of fixed uh, fixed costs, and, and locking in. And, and to Jane's point, you, you, sometimes you want flexibility. Other times Times, and especially in this low interest rate environment, now is the time mm. to consider locking in if you're at that point. Yeah, uh, there's, there was a time when interest rates were 18 <laughs> percent, so yeah. you never know. Uh, not that we're going there anytime soon, but we are going somewhere else on the show. Next, financial crises in Europe, a slow U.S. recovery. Should you move your RSPs into Canadian options all the way or stay diversified? The Monday Money Panel returns in a moment here on Alberta Primetime. Welcome back to the Monday Money Panel. We are going to debate where best to move your RRSPs these days, if only we all knew the answers. There are a lot of factors to consider. So let's just start with our weekly feature. What are you watching, Jane? You get first crack. Well, what I'm watching are the earnings. Earnings season started in the U.S. this afternoon with Alcoa. They came out with not bad earnings. Their revenues were better than expected, but the stock, mark, the stock seems to be kind of flat on the day. We're looking for the guidance. What do they say going forward? They're cautiously optimistic about the U.S., a little concerned about China. So that'll start to give us an indication of, of what uh, companies in the U.S., the big companies, are looking for, which then can help us form ideas of where we should be. Isn't that kind of tough, though, because we got some decent job numbers from the states recently and the markets dropped? We did, but those decent job numbers... One of the reasons they may have dropped is that they're not getting a lot of people that are unemployed coming back into the marketplace, and that's what some of the analysts were looking for. So some it's good but not great. It's good but not great, and they still need a lot of jobs to be created to get out of the hole. Shafiq, what have you got your eye on? Uh, well, primarily the, what's going to affect the Canadian economy is, is what's going on in Europe, whether Greek defaults. But domestically, uh, again, I'm still a big believer in Canada, and domestically to, uh, on Thursday, new home prices are out. And uh, same on Friday, uh, the average home prices. So these are leading economic indicators domestically on what's going to happen with the Canadian real estate market, which affects the Canadian economy. So. And are you seeing the numbers are flat? No, the numbers should be up. I mean, the, the new home prices uh, seem to be up, but there are a lot of warning signs. TD Economics put out a warning sign that the, the Calgary real estate market, or, or the, sorry, the, the Alberta real estate market could be overvalued by about 10%. So Beth, what's on your radar? Worry. Well, certainly we continue to watch for the risks and uh, we, we are continuing to watch the risk of the European market and the contagion that may come that way. That may feel like an old story, but it's not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, certainly uh, the, with the new year, didn't mean that we can fr freshly wash and move forward and, and, uh, and get away from that. So Europe still remains a, a risk to watch. Asia continues to be a risk to watch as well. And Asia, again, the risk there isn't so much uh, going into recession, but just lower growth than everybody else is counting on uh, to kind of bail them out and, and keep going forward. Uh, out of the U.S., we are quite optimistic. Uh, we're certainly seeing incremental improvements uh, in this tepid growth environment that uh, has been forecasted. And that does look like it will continue to plod forward. I don't think it will be without its risks, but I think it uh, will be certainly a source for opportunity. Okay, Jane, with all that to consider, kick off a debate for us on where Albertans might considering moving their RSPs. Uh, you know, there's so much to choose from. We're talking about Canada being strong, uh, Canadian bonds, or, or is diversification still a good rule? Diversification is still a good rule. I would not be anywhere in Europe on European stocks or European bonds at this point in time. I would be on an avoid, much as Shafiq and Beth are both saying. That's still the primary of risk. But you want to make sure that you're diversified both by your sectors as well as your geography. So if you want something that's foreign, you could look to the U.S., but you have to understand you have a current currency risk as well as the risk of the markets in those stocks. Just choose carefully. So Beth, how do you find those decent foreign investments? Well, actually, we, we, we see great opportunities in foreign investment globally. Well, you have to be very careful. This is not a time to index. You don't want to buy the good, the bad, and the ugly all together. You just want to find those good companies. Uh, there's opportunity in emerging markets, but we prefer to find those emerging market opportunities through developed countries uh, and through co uh, co uh, companies in those developed countries. So we're finding great opportunities in Unilever, Johnson & Johnson, those big blue-chip organizations that really have that exposure. To, to us, that's really where the opportunity is. So, Shafiq, the old rule of buy your RSPs, contribute monthly and ignore them until it's time to retire, uh, no longer the case? No, I don't think so. I think uh, 
It is, it is no longer the case. You're right, Jen, because I think you want to pay more attention to the RSVs, especially in a volatile environment. There are, there are actually times where the markets tend to outperform um, others. Like January, February, December, they're considered excellent performing months. Uh, sell in May go away. I think that still applies. September, October still applies. Um, the one quick point I would also add is that Canada represents about 3% of the world's GDP. Uh, although it looks fantastic right now, you do want to put your money, like, like Beth was saying, in other high GDP countries like the emerging markets, like China, Japan. Uh, of course, like Jane mentioned, Europe is not the place to be. The euro is mm -hmm. going to go down and you, get, you do face a currency risk. There's two things I would suggest that you, you investors want to avoid doing. Don't look at last year's returns as a way to select your investment for this year coming forward. Mm. If you do that, you're going to choose a bond fund, hands down. And in fact, bond funds did very well last year in the 9% range, whereas a balance fund only did around 1%. Uh, the other thing is try not to get too domestically focused. As much as we, we talk about currency risk and so forth. There are great opportunities outside of Canada, and Canada really is very sector specific between financials, energy, and commodities and materials. And okay. so if, if we want to diversify away from that, we've got to be very careful not to get too centrically oriented on Canada. Quick change of topic before we go. Alberta Venture and KPMG have unveiled the Fast Growth 50. That's a list of the fastest growing companies in the province. Jane, the number one company, a software firm, not an energy outfit. Seven of the top ten, not energy. They're tech and business services, even a dog groomer in there. Anomaly or does it tell us Alberta's economy is diversifying? Well, let's hope it tells us Alberta's economy is diversifying. We all need that. We all need that. That's a really great start. That's seven companies out of 50. We'll know we're diversifying, I think, when we get more companies that are not energy-based that are in that fastest growing. What we don't know from that survey is how big were they, how big are they now? So they may be fastest growing, but have they gone from uh, micro to very small or have they gone from very small to just small. We, we don't really have any matrix on Shafiq, that. Shafiq, we've only got about 30 seconds left, but do you see anything in that fast growth 50 that you can use as a financial advisor perhaps, or is it just a fun list? No, it's a very intriguing list. Uh, as a financial advisor, you, you, you do see good names in the list. The one thing I would just encourage people to look at is that a lot of the list is private. They, weren't, they aren't just all publicly uh, traded companies. So the opportunity in the small cap sector looks promising and it's great for Albertans. All right. Well, thank you all for your input tonight. I, 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 <laughs> there's so much to absorb and you do a great job of uh, helping explain it. Thank you to all of our guests. Jane Alm is an investment advisor with Angus Watt Advisory and National Bank Financial. Beth Hamilton Keene, a director and portfolio manager at Moore Investment Management. And Shafi Karani is director and senior executive financial advisor with Investors Group Calgary.